each one of the countless objects in the physical world presents an example of some form of energy. And the myriad activities that go on around us involve transformations of energy from one form to another. These men expend energy or do work in raising this load since they lift its weight a certain distance up against the force of gravity. But they do no work in the mechanic sense in merely holding up the load. Technically, work is done only when an object is moved some distance by some force. Energy transformation occurs in the operation of the pile driver. As the hammer is raised above the pile, it gains potential energy, increased capacity for doing work upon the pile. The potential energy is equal to the weight of the hammer multiplied by the height to which it has been lifted. In other words, is equal to the work done upon it in lifting it to this position. Each time the hammer is released, the potential energy is transformed into a second type of energy, kinetic energy, which an object possesses by virtue of its motion. The hammer is now doing work by forcing the pile a certain distance into the resisting earth. The work done is found by multiplying the force of the blow by the distance through which it acts. Another example of potential energy is that possessed by water held back by a dam. When the water falls over the dam, this potential energy is transformed to kinetic energy. The falling water may be guided through pipes and its kinetic energy communicated to a turbine, causing it to turn and drive an electric generator. The generator converts the mechanical energy of the turbine into electrical energy, which goes out over wires to do useful work. When the water has reached a lower level, its potential energy has been reduced in proportion to the distance fallen but only after the water has reached the sea has it lost all of its potential energy. Energy may be made usefully available by other types of transformations. Sticks of dynamite, for example, contain a large amount of chemical potential energy. This chemical energy is transformed into heat energy when the dynamite is set off by the electric spark. The sudden expansion of gases, the explosion, accomplishes work. A third type of energy, about the fundamental nature of which as yet we know little, goes by the name of radiant energy. Radiant energy sometimes takes the form of light or heat as from the sun. After passing through the glass roof of the greenhouse, the radiant energy is transformed into heat as it strikes the soil. In the green leaves of plants, it is transformed into chemical energy of sugars and starches. In the engine of this train, the energy of the fuel is being converted into mechanical energy, but some of it is being diverted into unusable heat energy in the wheels and rails through friction. In the hot box, we have an extreme example of this. Such diversion by friction may be demonstrated quantitatively with this apparatus. These two brass cups fit closely together. When this experiment is started, these surfaces will rub against each other. We fill the inner cup with water. The outer cup is fastened to a shaft that will revolve. A disc is attached to this inner cup. A thermometer is inserted into the water and a weight prevents the inner cup from turning when the outer cup revolves. The temperature of the water is now 18 degrees centigrade. The friction between the two cups generates heat 
which raises the temperature of the water and the cups. All the work done is here converted into heat. After three minutes, the temperature of the water has been raised to 28 degrees centigrade. The distance traveled is measured by a revolution counter and from the stabilizing weight, the force is measured. Thus, the heat equivalent of work may be determined. From this and a host of other experiments, it has been found that when to the energy wasted by friction in this or any other operation is added the energy usefully employed, their sum exactly equals the amount of energy originally available. As we have said, every activity is an example of transformation of energy. In none of these is energy ever created, nor is it ever destroyed. This is the principle of conservation of energy. The simple lever, as well as the most complicated machinery, operates in conformity with this principle. In the lever, a smaller force acting through a greater distance can overcome a much greater force acting through a correspondingly smaller distance. The original energy measured by the work applied at one end of the lever emerges in equal amount at the other end except for that lost in friction. We must not think, however, that by machines we can increase a man's power. His power is the amount of work he can do in a given time. In other words, it is the total work he does divided by the time he takes to do it. Power, in its technical sense, may be illustrated by this setup. The pulleys are so constructed that the man need exert only one-fifth the force which the horse exerts in order that they both may lift objects of equal weight. The man must travel five times as far as the horse, thus working five times as long. Consequently, the man develops only one-fifth as much power as does the horse, although he does the same total amount of work. The common unit of power is called a horsepower. It is equivalent to a rate of doing work that will raise a weight of 550 pounds, a distance of one foot in one second. In our modern industrial world, we have largely replaced the use of men and animals by machines which derive their power from our natural resources such as oil and coal. The energy latent in both coal and oil is sunlight that was stored up in growing things like this fossil plant and then buried millions of years ago. The potential energy latent in these fuels is transformed by machines into thermal, mechanical and electrical forms. Even these enormous resources of energy someday may be exhausted, and we may be forced to others, which likewise we shall owe to the sun. The sun's heat lifts the water. We may yet need to harness countless untamed waterfalls. The sun calls forth winds whose tremendous power may be put to work again, as of old. The sun and the moon lift up the tides, a storehouse of energy yet untouched. We know that matter itself, this rock, this continent, this spinning earth, contains an inexhaustible supply of energy. We can as yet only speculate as to whether we shall ever be able to unlock the prodigious stores of intrinsic energy now bound up in the tiny atoms of which all matter is composed. In our never-ending search for new sources of energy to drive our machines, we may be able to utilize this energy at some time in the distant future.